you come to one of the seats. Would you like to sit right here? Oh, okay. We're ready. <laughs> you can all be seated, thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Larry King, and uh, I just had a wonderful time interviewing the Dalai Lama for my program, which will air Thursday on Hulu and Aura. He is a wonderful man. I'm 81, he's 80. Ah, I can't believe it. Here they, come. Here they come, the birthday well-wishers, the Agape Children's Choir. Are they, are... So Larry, um, one of the things, as you know, uh, when we deal with His Holiness of Dalai Lama and the program, it kind of goes as it goes, and that it doesn't always go necessarily so as So what planned. screwed up, Anne? So nobody screwed up, nobody screwed up at all, because we're all com comfortable with what everything up? that happens. All we need to say is that um, the, the, there are a number of people, in addition to all the people who were on the tape, who were wanting to wish His Holiness. <laughs> what happened, then? I don't know what happened, but it's okay, right? Okay, because right. I got to go. Okay, you got to so go. you're going to take over? All right, I'll take over. Do you really have to go? Yeah, I really do. I'm sorry you have to go. Well, I had a wonderful time, and I got to get back. You know, I got a wife, I got kids, and I got to... Well, you know, we all understand that. Are we glad that Larry King stopped up to say hello? <laughs> uh, uh. It's a delight to stand here with the great Ann Curry. Uh, thank you, His Holiness. Have a wonderful birthday. Have a great afternoon, everybody, and thank you all very much. Ann Curry. <laughs> Wait. On so, a scalp, scalp. <laughs> All tradition. On a scalp. Ah. Oh, the scarf. Come on, you So, um, as you may have noticed, over the last couple of days, there have been a number of events. And one of the things that happens on these events is because everyone is so excited to have it go just right for His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, on his birthday. What happens is we, we tend to get it very well organized. But he says, no, too formal. Thank you. So it goes as it goes. <laughs> Congratulations. This will also serve. This will also serve as a talus for Yom Kippur. <laughs> well done. Well done. All right. So, <laughs> so. Um, today is His Holiness's uh, 80th birthday, and uh, you. <laughs> Order, order, order. He is a man who said to us that um, my religion is simple, very simple. My religion is kindness. And he's worked for many, many years to teach us about compassion. Uh, it has been something he's dedicated himself to for decades. And he did it without expectations. He did it because it was what he felt he needed to do. That was his purpose. And because he did that, um, the world started to recognize that there was something important in his message. And the world started to respond and react. And he's been given the Nobel Peace Prize, 
and he is seen as one of the me most important voices for peace in our world. And so today, uh, because he has given us so much, awakened us to um, new ideas about the value of compassion, not to see compassion as a weakness, but actually as strength. We are so glad that all of you are here to help us give back and show him that we love him as much as he has loved us. You've heard some of the happy birthday wishes. Some of the others who would like to join now live on stage to offer their best wishes um, include, among them, philanthropist Carol Nappy. Blessings and happy birthday, Your Holiness, on being 80 years young, and may you enjoy many more to come. We celebrate your life of nonviolent peacemaking. We had the privilege, my husband and my entire family, an honor to have His Holiness to our home to help present a peace forum and peace concert with many Nobel laureates and also many musical artists, which we called Common Ground at SU in 2013. There were over 30,000 people in attendance to hear His Holiness and many Smile. people talk about peace and how we can achieve it. Go globally, His Holiness has planted the seeds of wisdom and knowledge which we have learned when nourished by compassion, watered by kindness, cultivated by tolerance, shaped with forgiveness, and warmed by the illumination of our love, always blossoms into a beautiful flower of peace and hope. With these strong, deep roots, we can withstand many harsh winds of anger and the storms of prejudice. These deep roots, we hope, will spread understanding all over the world. His Holiness, we are grateful for your inspiration of many generations and to become involved in open dialogue, to call us to take action, to help us make our world a kinder, gentler, and most importantly, a more passionate place. We must preserve our environment now, learn how to live in harmony with nature, and find our true paths of inner peace, which will lead us to our destination, hopefully one day of world peace. Your Holiness, you have gifted us with a key. We must take it now and open the door and let's take everybody's hand next to us and walk through that door. I'm ready, are you? I'm taking you. <laughs> also joining us now, a personal student for 30 years of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He also manages the Dalai Lama Foundation, which His Holiness established with his Nobel Peace Prize. His name is Rajiv Marota. <laughs> Your Holiness, that's indeed a great privilege and a great blessing for me to be here. Um, we have spoken so much about His Holiness being the embodiment of compassion, and as a very unworthy student of more than 30 years, for me personally, the greatest example has been his great compassion for suffering a student such as me. Uh, Your Holiness, you've often described yourself as uh, the chela of the Indian guru. Thousands of years have passed since Buddhism traveled to Tibet. We are deeply grateful 
and I speak here on behalf of more than a billion Indians, that the Chela has now become our guru. And so on behalf of more than a billion Indians, I give you on their behalf and me as an unworthy failing student our warmest, sincere birthday greetings that every happiness ever be yours. We celebrate you, Your Holiness, not just for what you say or what you do, but who you are. Watching him has been a great privilege, and he has embodied at every step and with every breath all that he teaches and all that he preaches. So he is not just what he does, but who he is. And it is who he is that we celebrate because the rest really follows from who he is. We celebrate your holiness, as I said, for who you are, but for the manner in which you have embodied the highest aspiration of the human condition. It is His Holiness who gives us the hope that as travelers on the journey of spirituality, of journey of human perfection, it is when we look at you, Your Holiness, that we find the confidence that that aspiration, that perfection, that goal of seekers is indeed possible in human form. Your Holiness, amongst the many aspects of the common predicament of mankind today that you stand for has been your deep passion and commitment to interreligious dialogue. You have had the courage, Your Holiness, to put on a skull cap, to go to a mosque and perform the namaz, and to move on to a church with a cross around your neck and to sing a Christian hymn or to go to a Hindu temple or a Jewish mosque and perform those practices and rituals of different traditions. So for His Holiness, his, com his passion, his commitment of what he talks about isn't manifest merely in words, but in the outer reaches of his striving and his action. He's 80 years old, but he's still a student. He spends six, seven, eight hours a day in religious practice, still receives instruction and transmission from lamas younger than him. I could go on here as a, as, as, as a eulogy to a great master, but I will conclude merely with a traditional prayer, uh, uh, a long life prayer to His Holiness, if my cell phone doesn't let me down, and here it is. <laughs> uh, O oh, our gurus and your line of lamas, for whom we have the deepest gratitude, you who are the repository of the three secret powers of body, speech, and mind of innumerable traditions and Buddhas, who manifest in miraculous ways to each of your students and followers according to his capacity, to you who are the wishfulling gems, the source of all virtues and good qualities, we offer our prayers with intense devotion that the protector of the great land of snows, Tenzin Gyatso, upholder of virtue and the highest spiritual aspiration, the great ocean, his name translates as ocean of wisdom, the Dalai Lama. May you live for a hundred eons and may blessings pour on you that your aspirations as a bodhisattva, a Buddha who seeks consciously and chooses rebirth and the suffering of the human condition to teach and serve humanity. So may your holiness have a long life and continue to shower us with your blessings. And in the, and in, 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 in the tradition of uh, uh, Hindi, the major language of India, Aapki Janam Din Ka Shubh Kamana.
And we also have one more um, happy birthday greeting from uh, a man whose organization has helped to protect ancient Tibetan monasteries. His name is Juan Ruiz Naupawi. Okay, come. Con Sacho, con lo Yayupepe, Tungarla, Sandy Tashi de Le Shu. Thank you. <laughs> en este día tan especial, soy portador de un saludo del amor de los países de Latinoamérica. On this very special day, I am the bearer of a greeting and of love from the Latin American uh, countries. Y de nuestra comunidad en honor a la Aguila Dorada. And also from our community in honor of the Golden Eagle. Los cielos y la tierra te saludan, bendito Dalai Lama. The heavens and the earth greets you, blessed Dalai Lama. Los ángeles y los budas te honran por ser un maestro ejemplar. The angels and the buddhas honor you for being an exemplary master. La divinidad en todas sus formas te muestra a ti como un hermano y aliado para devolverle la luz y la esperanza a la humanidad. Divinity, in all of its forms, sets you before us as a brother and an ally, so as to return the light and hope to humanity. Y nosotros, los humanos, tus hermanos, te damos gracias por tu oración y acción para despertarnos hacia el amor y la compasión. And we, human beings, your brothers, give you thanks for your prayer and your action, for awakening us to love and to compassion. Amado leader. Beloved leader. Hablas de compasión porque derrotaste la impiedad. You speak of compassion because you have defeated impiety. Expresas el amor porque extirpaste dentro de ti el yo del odio. You express love because you have extirpated or, or rooted up from within you the ego of hatred. Oras y vives en la paz porque aniquilaste el germen de la violencia en tu interior. You pray and live in peace because you have annihilated the seed of violence from within you. Tu castidad es celebrada porque triunfaste sobre la lujuria. Your chastity is celebrated because you have triumphed over lust. Moriste en el ego y renaciste en la virtud. You died to the ego and you were reborn into virtue. Luchaste y venciste. You fought and you overcame. Oras y trabajas. You pray and you work. Solo así, de victoria en victoria, ha sido posible tu iluminación. Only in this way, from victory to victory, has your illumination been possible. Nos muestras que el Buda no nace, se hace. And you show us that a Buddha is not born a Buddha, one becomes a Buddha. Quiero honrar a Grecia en este momento. And I want to honor Greece in this moment. El filósofo griego Diógenes, caminando a plena luz del día, con una lámpara encendida buscaba a un hombre honesto, despierto, y no lo encontró. The Greek philosopher Diogenes, searching in full daylight with a lit lamp for an honest and awakened man was unable to find one. Yo le digo ahora a Diógenes. And now I address myself to Diógenes. Diógenes, complacete. Diógenes, rejoice. Ese hombre ya nació. This man has now been born. Y vive entre nosotros. And he lives amongst us. Se llama Tenzin Yaxo. And he is called Tenzin Yaxo. His Holiness Dalai Lama. His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Y hoy cumple 80 años. And today he is 80 years old. Wow. 
Este hombre transfigurado en la compasión tiene un sueño altamente realizable. This man transfigured by compassion has a highly achievable dream. Una humanidad feliz. That of a happy humanity. Buddha, maestro. Buddha, master. Hermano. Brother. Amigo. Friend. Gracias. Thank you. Por ser un ejemplo de lo que predicas. For being an example of what you preach. Y por recordarnos. And for reminding us la posibilidad que nosotros, la humanidad, of the possibility that we as a humanity también puede despertar can also awaken si quiere if we want y se lo propone. And if we set our minds to it. Salud y larga vida, His Holiness Dalai Lama. Health and long life to His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Tungare nye mo sandishu, Tungare nye mo sandishu, Tungare nye mo sandishu, Tungare nye mo sandishu. Pues ya da esta. Scab, scab. Pues, cara, cara, cara. Thank you. We also have some children here who want to sing to His Holiness. Um, his Holiness has a special love for children. They are the Agape Children's Choir. Mm.
It's from water that I come. It's to earth that I will go. I'm the fire of transformation and the wind of change that blows. It's from water that I come. It's to earth that I will go. I'm the fire of transformation and the wind of change that blows. Shivaya, oh Mother Earth, dear Mother Earth, we are your blessed children, born of your beauty, born of your faith. Oh Mama Shivaya. Hey, kids, you want to come around and give His Holiness a hug? Come on, come on in, come on in. He wants to see you too. There you go. <laughs> I mean, who at 80 wouldn't want to be hugged by a lot of children for your birthday? And don't you want to say something, young man, about what we need to get everybody to do right now? We want to say, Go Dalai Lama, right? What was the thing you said yesterday? Go Dalai Lama! Whoa! Go Dalai Let's celebrate! So now that they've had a chance to sing, we want to give you a chance to sing. Ladies and gentlemen, is it time to sing Happy Birthday for His Holiness the Dalai Lama? All right. He's got one big candle because we decided to be kind and not put 80 on his cake. <laughs> Compassion is kind of the theme around here. Okay. Well, how about, are we ready kids to sing happy birthday? What do you think? Will you help us sing happy birthday? Yeah. Okay, because you know how to sing, not everybody here on the panel with all the respect does, including me. Okay, let's get the last hug. One more, no, here we go. Ready? Happy birthday to you. Cha, cha, cha. And many more. Yeah. <laughs> now, Your Holiness, it's your turn to, to uh, work. Now you have to make a wish and oh. blow out the candle, if you wouldn't mind, sir. <laughs> yes. Oh, oh, oh. Get that. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, children. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think, are we going to cut the cake here? Ah, okay. So everyone on the panel who is now hidden behind all of these children, um, would you like a piece of cake? We'll begin. All right. Thank this you. is a birthday party. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, kids. We'll save some cake for you.
the Agape Children's Choir. <laughs> Maybe we should start with just a piece of cake for His Holiness. What do you think? Let's just do that so we can begin with our next part, and the rest of us will wait until after. Would that be all right? Okay. Well, no, you, you did all the work. You bring up. You, so, yes. Thank you. Yes. I think too big. <laughs> too big. I think too half. Big. Um, should we move this aside maybe so that we can, uh, um, forgive me, I'm going to oh, use the oh, stage hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you want to bring the cake. He wants that back. Please, please. Yeah. He wants a table. Yeah, we're just going to bring that back. He wants to put that right here. Yeah. He's in charge. So, um, which is good. So, great. Right in there is, yeah, you don't, yeah, good, good. All right. I'm going to give you this mic. Does everyone have a microphone? Yes, do you have a microphone? Do you have a microphone? I'm just going to have you hold on to that, okay, so we can begin. All right. So um, now we have come to uh, the portion of this birthday. What is this? Those are more napkins and um, mm. forks and knives. So <laughs> they were concerned you wanted to eat a lot, but um, <laughs> he wants to keep the table. Um, so maybe uh, if you want... Yeah, you can take that. That'd be great. Thank you. Ah, he wants to share some cake. So uh, this is, um, Sh Shireen Embody just got a piece of cake. Okay, I think His Holiness is insisting that everybody on the stage gets a piece of cake. I think that's what's happening now. So we're doing that, and I'll bring you the plates. We're going to bring cake for everyone. He does not want to eat alone, all right? So you have a job to do, all right? Okay, there you go. Yes. There you go. Bring right. quick, 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 Thank quick, you quick, very quick. much. It's coming, it's coming, and I think you have to move fast. So they're coming, Your Holiness. While they're bringing cake for everyone. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, good. Oh, that's cake, cake, Jody cake. Uh, Williams, uh, who didn't want any cake uh, because uh, she is um, not eating sugar, I guess, uh, right today. She is um, a Nobel Peace Laureate. Uh, she won a Nobel Peace Prize in. 1997 for her work to ban and clear landmines. She's a peace activist and she's joining us here today. Uh, Shireen Abadi, who is uh, in purple here, who got the first piece of cake, she is an Iranian uh, human rights activist. She's done a lot of work to help women and children and refugees. Actress and human rights activist Julie Ormond is here. Uh, Julia is a, um, she is um, doing very important work to end slavery and human trafficking, and she's a former UN Goodwill ambassador. <laughs> to her left is Robert Thurman, who most probably everyone here knows. He is a top American scholar, a renowned American scholar in Tibetan <laughs> uh, Buddhism. <laughs> to his left is uh, Anthony Melikoff. He's a philanthropist, a businessman, an immigrant, and also the founder of an important organization called Unite for Good, which inspires uh, change through kindness. You've met one who you haven't met is someone to my right, who is Paul Ekman. He is a, a psychologist who's pioneered the study of emotions. In fact, he is named one of the most influential psychologists of the 20th century. He's, he teaches us about emotional awareness, and uh, he is uh, highly regarded as someone who understands what is happening inside this noggin. And so we're excited to have you here also a part of this panel, Paul. And to his right is Dolores Huerta. She's a human rights activist. She co-founded. <laughs> Dolores apparently does not need an introduction, but I'm still going to give her one. She co-founded the National Farm Workers Association, which became the, uh, eventually the United Farm Workers uh, Union to improve the lives of workers, women, and immigrants. And we have also, to her right, Gloria 
Estefan, who is not only uh, a world-famous singer and songwriter, she is also someone who speaks out for religious freedom and human rights in Cuba. And of course, you know Rajiv, who, gave, who spoke very eloquently earlier in the uh, Well Wishes for His Holiness. So our topic... <laughs> Oh, hello. And you also uh, know as well, um, 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 sorry, Ms. Nappy, right, hello, who spoke also eloquently this morning. So thank you so much also for I didn't realize you were back there, Ms. Nappy. So we are uh, all gathered here to talk about um, a very sort of broad subject, but I think the most meaningful subject. It's a subject of wisdom. And Your Holiness, of all the events that you have had here, um, for your birthday. This is the event that most people wanted to come to. This was the one the people came fastest. They wanted to come to this one. The tickets for this one sold fastest. So there's a real need, a wish for wisdom. And I don't mean to put you on the spot, uh, but I am going to put you on the spot and ask you, At 80 years old, what is the most important or the most meaningful to you piece of wisdom that you would like everyone who is listening, not just in this room, but also in the live stream that is currently ongoing on Facebook? What would you like for them to know or perhaps try to know? Is it in your bag? Oh. <laughs> ah, he knew I was going to ask Wisdom, this vision, experience. I think experience comes first. Through that way, through combination, experience, and human intelligence, then I think wisdom comes. Uh, then wisdom creates vision. So firstly, I think experience. Uh, so of course, uh, and according to sort of certain tradition, a different tradition, so maybe it's a different explanation. Uh, but me, uh, now here I'm talking as a human being, not as a believer. Because I stress we really need sense of oneness of seven billion human beings. Then we have to talk as a human being, not a believer. Believe comes secondary level. Then different belief here and there. So then I think sometimes it's difficult to communicate one firm believer and non believer. Difficult. When we talk on the human level, then we can easily communicate. Mentally, or I should say, emotionally, physically, seven billion human beings, same. And, and more important, all seven billion human beings want happy life. And all have a right to achieve happy life. So, uh, so now, happiness or wisdom not come from somewhere, mysterious level. Okay, good. If one individual believes that, wonderful. 
<laughs> yeah. But then, yeah. then if that person who believes that, if you ask some questions, how, uh, why, then not much answer. Difficult, isn't it? So, as a, as a, as a normal human being, then we can easily communicate. So now I feel uh, you are older than me, isn't it? Yes. You are. Eighty. Eighty. Eighty one. You're eighty one. Yes. You know, and then one year differences. That's a big difference. Uh, <laughs> So I oh, prefer minute, this Del morning. Uh, Your Holiness, Dolores is 85. Oh, oh 85. Oh. oh. Then I want, I want to share. You come here. 84 year old. Now Dolores, human level. You have to sit next to him. No differences. There you are. On the second level. Good to okay. have the more honored chair. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you wish you were older? So, <laughs> that's a, uh, so, whole life actually struggle uh, to achieve happiness and joyfulness. It's all right to achieve that. So then, from a young age, you see, the different circumstances, and sometimes difficult circumstances, is helpful to gain more deeper experience. Easy life, sometimes, you see, uh, not, I think, really tested your inner strength. Difficult situation, actually, testing our inner strength. So, uh, so now, an uh, 80 year old person. Uh, I felt I'm oldest, but now this person <laughs> older than me, this person also older than me. <laughs> so, in the front of these people, I'm still younger. <laughs> <laughs> so, still yet to gain more experiences. <laughs> So I think experience combined with our brain, brain have the ability uh, to investigate what's the reality, what's the causes of that, what, what kind of result will be. This intelligence have that capacity. Then this is combined with experience and then this intelligence then you develop some kind of realistic, holistic, long-term interest that uh, I may call wisdom. Not harmful to anybody, but some, something good for everybody as a human being. That I may call wisdom. Then wisdom A vision, or oh. uh, if we make effort, this method, that method, uh, tirelessly, then we might achieve, like for example here, a peaceful world, compassionate world. Everybody, wherever you go, Whenever we, you meet people, feeling of brother, human brother, sister, you immediately you see develop closeness feeling. Then no basis of fear. So then I think this planet can be really happy, one human family. 
We can achieve that. So then, if lifelong make make effort fail, then okay. I have no regret. I do my best. Now fail, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like that. So that's my view. Very good view. Thank you, Holiness. <laughs> Your His Holiness raised the question. I think I should direct this to you, Paul. Um, being the third oldest, no, second oldest person here, um, His Holiness raised this point that bad experiences, the experiences that lead to wis wisdom, that lead then to vision, the bad experiences, the ones that test us with pain and suffering and fear, those experiences can be sometimes the best teachers to teach us about wisdom. That's what I understood him to say. Can you speak to that at all, given your deep research into the human mind uh, and what you've learned about what elasticity there is to transform? All you really need to do... Oh. Oops. Use this. All you... Does this work? Yes. yes. All you really need to do is watch the evening news to see that experience is not always leading to wisdom. <laughs> How can we achieve that wisdom that's necessary? Part of it and it is the unending brilliance of my younger friend here. <laughs> Part of the distortions come from our failure to be in touch with and understand our emotions that can mislead us rather than help us. And it was his idea that we needed to develop a map of these emotions so we could better understand ourselves. Because wisdom starts with knowledge of ourself. If you don't know yourself, that no wisdom will be forthcoming that can be helpful to others. And yet there are distortions. There are distortions in our lives that we have to come to terms with. And I hope by this fall, by October, you'll all be able to go on the internet and to use this emotional atlas that the Dalai Lama has not just requested, but inspired and helped. And it'll be there free for everyone to use. But the Dalai Lama speaks of problems coming out of ignorance. I'd rather use the term misinformation, a failure to understand the world as it is, a failure to understand and accept differences. We are all the same, and we're all different. Both of those are true. Both of those have to be accepted. The last thing I want to comment on is that he's provided an ethical framework for us to live our lives by. It's in a book, a brilliant book, called Ethics for a New Millennium. If you haven't gotten it, get it. It's a wonderful guide as to how to live your life in an ethical fashion. It's another great, we've talked about compassion, that's interweaved with an ethical life. It's a wonderful book, it's a wonderful guide. Thank you. Thank you. So, Bob. Oh, oh. Oh. I may want, you see, one ad here. You see, I mean, these, I see these speakers, I think a very close friend of mine. 
So their viewpoint may be a little biased. <laughs> so you individual should think more seriously uh, and investigate. I think ultimate guidance come from our own, I may call wisdom, not others' word. So that's why, as far as Buddhism is concerned, you are your own master. Your future entirely in your own hand. So think more, think more. <laughs> so if we are our own master and the idea is not to act in blind faith, but with actively researching and making sure we double check what we want to embrace and we need this inner life and this inner awareness to actually use experience and the emotions we feel to find our step past what we see on the evening news towards wisdom and change. Bob Thurman, I think you're the I think you're next up to tell us how do we find this internal I know this is the big question. It's a big question, probably the biggest. How do you find this internal connection where you understand enough to interpret what's happening, bad and good, but so much yeah. bad, and move it into what will ultimately be better towards wisdom? Right. Well, well one thing I, I would like to say in the presence of my guru and his elder friend over here, <laughs> um, elder friend here. is that um, wisdom as, as they both said, it means the wisdom of knowing reality. And His Holiness is often says he is the son of Nalanda, the 17 great pandits of Nalanda. Pandit in the old days meant something like a professor, actually, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it and, today, and, a pandit actually. Means and these were yeah. the great masters of Indian. Um, science, inner science, the science of the mind, and um, probably Paul Aikman's previous lives, he was one of the pundits of Nalanda, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, they codified the maps of the emotions, this and that, but in a way where, and His Holiness learned those maps of the emotions, and he is a product of that curriculum, but, and so he, but that's in a very difficult, you have to know Sanskrit and Tibetan and meditate and so on. So he asked Paul to make one that can be used today, mm. realistically, by people. Mm. Because people have an idea, we are, we are kind of conditioned, and my universities are guilty of this, the education system, that people are supposed to feel a little bit unable to understand reality. So they have to go and look for, they have to watch the evening news they have to go and look for some authority. Whereas Buddha insisted, and the Solnas the Dalai Lama, the 17 pundits of Nalanda, that the human being is capable of understanding reality, a hundred percent. And even any percent that they do helps. And there's a great deal of talk about compassion. And of course, it is the most important medicine and balm for all of the world's ills. But the great Masters of Nalanda, the great inner scientists, all say that compassion comes from wisdom. Because wisdom means knowing reality. Knowing reality means knowing that you are not the main one in the world. <laughs> and knowing that the other is equally important as you, and therefore you feel compassion for their suffering equal to your own suffering. So without the wisdom and without us having the courage to know that we should mu and must know reality better, always better and better, then compassion will not be powerful enough to make the change in the world that we have to make. So I'm so honored to be here with your holiness on your birthday, you son of Nalanda <laughs> <laughs> University. And uh, here the way that you present this great teaching of realism as a human being, you know, not, that, not as some religious thing, but as the, the giving people the encouragement that they too can understand reality. And while I have the mic, just for one second, I wanted to just add something with the environment, earlier environmental panel, which is that one of the things we can all do with our politicians 
is we could ask them in all the countries of the world, not only America, to please take the $3.5 trillion subsidy that they make to the carbon producing energy companies who already make plenty of money by themselves and put that subsidy to spend on renewable energies and to realize His Holiness's dream of making the Sahara into a Tibetan farm. <laughs> Seriously, with solar energy, make the Sahara a Tibetan farm, why not? Why not? So I just wanted to add that up for the benefit of some of the environmentalists asked me. Actually, I offered 400, my $450 to Professor Ramanathan, <laughs> which he didn't accept because he said that uh, he didn't have a way to distribute it and, and my 450 wouldn't be enough. So then I mentioned the subsidies to him and he said, if we could transfer the subsidies, he would give me a discount. <laughs> So this is from an earlier panel we had this morning about climate change, in which a the climate scientist who um, discovered essentially the super greenhouse effect, who here teaches here at this university, said that it would cost uh, every American about four hundred and fifty dollars to actually um, reverse uh, climate change by doing something about the our dependence on fossil fuels. That there was actually a calculation, and so that's what the response you just got to uh, heard from. But um, let's now turn back to what you said earlier about the need um, to see the other as ourselves. Essentially, that the path to wisdom that we're now making the connection to. Um, that we need before we can find compassion is to look at each other and see that the other person is no more important, is no, that you're no more important than that person and that person is no more important than you. To see that everyone around, oh, except you, you no, know, maybe, no, no, no. <laughs> um, that the, everyone is your brother and your sister, your mother, your father, your child, uh, and to see the world in this manner. Um, so this idea, let's expound on this and see where we go with this idea as a path to wisdom. Dolores, you, I'm going to go now to the oldest person here on the panel uh, uh, and to say, um, you early on saw many years ago many other people, the farm workers who were vulnerable people, women, children, men, and you felt this great need that you had to do something, and you were one of the founders to do something to stand up for the rights of these vulnerable people. Can you speak to how your empathy, your ability to see them in this important way, allowed you to gain some wisdom, clarity, uh, to help you know what to do? And there's a microphone right there. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. And uh, Your Holiness, I know you said you were the son of a farmer and uh, that where is some of the, your first wisdom came from. And um, when we talk about uh, compassion, and um, I do believe that what His Holiness said about experience, that uh, wisdom does come from experience. Uh, because when I saw uh, the children of farm workers uh, that were hungry and their parents that were working so hard and not getting paid enough money for their work, and I knew that that was wrong, and I really didn't know uh, exactly how I was going to be able to help them, but I had a great mentor, a great man named Fred Roth Sr. Probably a lot of you don't know who he is. He, that's how good of an organizer he was, right? Because organizers build leaders, and that's what Mr. Ross did. And he taught me, he taught Cesar Chavez, uh, how to organize the people, how to show the people that they have power and that the power is in their person and this is all that they need. And if they can come together and take action, you get that experience through doing, through taking the actions. And this is how they build their leadership. And we were able to organize these workers so that they could fight for themselves. And that's what we need to know. And we need to, people have to understand that we don't, many people like the farm workers, they don't have a college education. They don't have money. They're not citizens. They don't speak the English language. But the one thing that we had to show them is, you have the power. You have the power. It's in your person. But if you do not do anything, if you wait for someone to come and do this for you, it's never going to happen. We have to take the responsibility to know that we have to do it for ourselves. And 
by meeting with people in their homes a few at a time, and then bringing them all together. And then they had the, the courage and self-confidence to go on strike, to ask people to do major boycotts. Following Gandhi's example, the marches, this is how we were able to change things for the farm workers. And it's not over yet, farm workers today, they're out there in the blistering sun today, you know, picking our food, picking Mr. Trump's food, Uh, and uh, so, you know, I just want to say to everyone here, we have had this beautiful um, gathering here to talk about the environment, uh, to talk about the things that we need to do uh, to end militarism, uh, to improve education for all of our children. And we do have to understand that if we don't do it, every single one of us, it's not going to happen. And I would hope that from this beautiful, beautiful gathering that we've had here, that every one of you will meet with five or six other people that you know. Because if we get all this knowledge and we don't take any action, really, this whole beautiful event was wasted, OK? Not just because we celebrate the Dalai Lama's birthday, because we have work to do. And I'm 85, but I'm out there doing that work because we have work to do. And I want everyone here to go and meet with five or six people that you know and then ask them to meet with another five or six people that they know and tell them that we are doing this compassionate work and that we've got to save our planet. And that if we don't do it, then if, because I don't care how much money they have on the other side, we have the people, we have the numbers. And with your permission, Anne, and your holiness's permission, I want to ask the people here. I want to ask you who's got the power. And I want you to answer me in a very loud voice. We've got the power. And I'm going to say what kind of power, and I want you to say people power. Can we do that? Yeah. OK, and shout as loud as you can so those people in the Congress that are making the decisions that are in denial because of the money that they get in their pockets, OK, that they will hear us, and we'll write them a letter and an email afterwards. So I'm going to say it. Who's got the power? We do. <laughs> what kind of power? People power. <laughs> One more time, but even louder. Who's got the power? People. What kind of power? People. Can we take action? I'm going to say in Spanish. We say yes, we can, as Obama said. But I'm going to say it in Spanish. Si sí, se puede. Everybody. Si sí, se puede. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, if the oldest among us can rally us so, then I think the bunch of us are, uh, we're, you know, we need to get off our bottoms and get going. Uh, clearly, uh, Dolores, we know uh, why you were so successful. You, <laughs> and it's uh, still embodied in you. Um, I've started to wonder, as we've talked about the idea of experience as a road to um, uh, wisdom and knowing yourself as a way of being, becoming wise. Um, if I may ask you, Shireen Mbadi, um, I understand from my research uh, that you were 22 when you became a judge in Iran. And very soon after the revolution, you became a clerk because you were not allowed to be a judge. And you have been struggling against many odds. Uh, to try to fight for women and for children throughout the world and in Iran. And I wonder, uh, to what degree do we begin to know ourselves or know the path to wisdom that does the experience of our own personal suffering, how does the experience of our own personal suffering lead us as an experience to knowing ourselves and finding wisdom? به نظر من هر شکستی می تواند مقدمه یک پیروزی باشه. I think that any loss can be an introduction to a victory. این بستگی داره به اینکه ما به شکست چگونه نگاه کنیم. Uh, it all depends on how we look at our loss. ببینید شما وقتی که می خواهید از یک بلندی به پرید ناخودآگاه یک قدم می دید عقب. When you want to jump a hurdle, you usually take a step back. I can show it to you. Okay. 
when you want to drop? Hmm. Then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, right, right. <laughs> this shakes to zendegi hamintore. Loss in life is the same as what I showed you. You take a step back so that you can jump higher. But من شغلم رو که قضاوت بود بسیار دوست داشتم و از دست دادم چون زن بودم. I lost my job that I really liked and my job was a judgeship because of the fact that I was a woman. اما این شکست باعث شد که من به موفقیت های بیشتری به دست بیارم. But this loss resulted in many many more successes for me. برای اینکه من به خودم گفتم من بایستی ثابت بکنم که شما اشتباه کردید که یک حقوقدان خوب رو از قضاوت برکنار کردید. Because I told myself I have to prove that they are the ones who have made the mistake of putting away a good scholar of law. و اولین کاری که کردم شروع کردم به نوشتن کتاب من 14 کتاب نوشتم که بعضی از اونها به زبان‌های متعدد ترجمه شده. The first thing that I did was started to write books. I have written 14 books and some of them have been translated into different languages. I founded three NGOs in Iran which were very useful. I attended many seminars and I spoke a lot. و این باعث شد که یک شهرتی برای من ایجاد بشه. And this created a fame for me. من جوایز زیادی بردم. I have won several prizes. و تا الان 27 دکترای افتخاری گرفتم. And up to now I have received 27 honorary doctorate degrees. <laughs> که یکی از جوایز من جایزه نوبل بود. And one of the prizes that I have won has been the Nobel Prize. و اگر من اون روز شکست نمیخوردم و من از قضاوت بر نمیداشتن چی میشد؟ Had I not suffered the loss of losing my judgeship on that day, what would have happened to me? من یه قاضی پیر بودم که الان وقت بازنشستگیم بود بعد میرفتم خونه میشستم. I would have been an older judge who had to retire today and sit at home. Banabarin, باور کنید که هر شکست می تواند مقدمه پیروزی بزرگتری باشد. So believe me when I say that any loss can be an introduction to a greater success. And when I talk to you young people, what I'm saying is, have a goal in life, have dreams, follow your dreams, and don't be scared of losing. برای اینکه شکست می تواند شما را به پیروزی های بزرگتر برسونه. Because loss can bring you success. پس بریم جلو. So go ahead. When I listened um, to Shreen, I was thinking about uh, you, Gloria, because um, you had setbacks that some might have thought you would never overcome. They weren't as painful as it was for Shireen to lose a job that was so meaningful to her. You broke your back, and you weren't sure you were ever going to rise again. You weren't sure what, you would, what would happen to your life. And as much as you have achieved, you've also suffered. So I wonder, what has that taught you that you might be willing to share about the value of overcoming um, and perhaps the value of suffering? That definitely touched a nerve 
your holiness, happy birthday, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this illustrious panel. Um, I've had the blessing and the privilege of making my life through music, which I think is one of the most beautiful things that unite us as human beings. And we share the commonality of music. Yes, we do. And music literally saved me, and a lot of your teachings have become a part of my music. Because very early in life, I realized, uh, going through different hardships, uh, the loss of my father to a very debilitating illness, and uh, having other people's music make me stronger and help me get through that time, I didn't realize how, how important that was going to be until later on in my life. I traveled the world uh, singing for many different cultures, many different religions in my audience. And what I always found was that at the same moments of the show, whether they spoke Spanish or English or neither, we had the same human reactions musically. And I felt such a kindred spirit to each person that was out there watching my show and such a unity. And later, uh, 25 years ago, actually, uh, on March 20th, I was uh, doing, I was on a tour, and we got sandwiched between two fully loaded 18-wheelers, and I broke my back. I was paralyzed in that accident. And what happened after that was pretty miraculous, because even though science told me that I would probably never walk again, and much less ever step on a stage, I had a doctor who had seen things far beyond what medicine would tell you. And he said to me uh, on my bedside, I will tell you what medicine says, and then I will tell you what I have found, which is that there are things that you cannot explain through science or medicine, that we have an amazing ability, each and every one of us, to heal ourselves and the world. And it depends on what you do or what you decide is going to have everything to do with your recovery. Then I received hundreds of thousands of letters from people all over the world telling me that they were sending me their love, their good thoughts, their prayers. I tell you that I could feel their prayers as an electrical energy with me in that hospital room. My family would come in and think I was delusional because I would say, I'm gonna be okay. And they had known the prognosis that they were told that was going to happen. And I would say, I'm going to be okay. I can feel everyone praying for me. They were from every religion possible, letters from all over the world. I went to temple, I went to my mosque, I went to my church, and I prayed for you. These are people that really knew nothing other than the music that I, that somehow become a part of their life. And they were giving back that love and respect to me because every time I write a song, I think about the person that's going to hear it. I think about what my words are going to do to their heart and to their mind. And I try always to choose to write songs that will empower them, that will make them feel good, that maybe will make them forget their difficulties for a little while and just entertain them but always to know that there is a very deep connection between all of us. And at that moment, I felt that connection very strongly, very physically. I felt like I was plugged into the wall. And I meditated when I couldn't move, when I was strapped to the board with the neck brace even before they operated on me. And I would imagine those prayers pouring into my body and going to the spot that I was injured and reconnecting whatever needed to be reconnected there. I didn't know what was happening, but I just envisioned each and every one of those feelings and thoughts that people were sending me going through me and healing whatever needed to be healed. And hello, here I am 25 years later. I got back on stage. Thank you. I got back on stage. I had the baby girl that they told me would never happen. Uh, yes, indeed. She's a very spiritual soul, and Your Holiness, you actually made a big difference in her life one day when she was 16 years old. I took her to see your speech about happiness at the University of Miami, and she was in a very 
she was in a fork in the road and didn't know which way to go. And your wisdom and teachings and words that day actually led her towards her path. And she made a very big decision that day to go into music, which for her was a daunting thing because of her mom and the, the thing, but that's what she loves. So I thank you very much for what you do to all the world, how, what, how you inspire us, how you tell us and show us how to become better human beings in a better world. And thank you to anyone that might have sent a prayer my way that is sitting here today or that is hearing my voice. Please know that it made a difference to me. And after that moment, I doubled my efforts to try to help whatever I could in whatever way I could throughout my life to make this a better world. We do it every day. I feel blessed to be able to do that in any small way that I can. And that's why it is such a blessing for me to be on this panel. So happy birthday, Your Holiness, and thank you. Thank, and thank all of you. I know His Holiness uh, believes in the power of compassion, the impact we have on each other, just as Gloria Esteban was talking about how com the compassion of others pouring in and all these letters encouraged her to believe, and she had this sort of mental state of healing. I just want to quickly turn to you, uh, just to ask you quickly, is there science that supports this idea that if, you, if your brain is locked into this state of believing and being positive and feeling compassion that you are actually more likely to heal? Well, certainly more likely, but not always. Uh, which means that that's the path we should take. It's our best path. It is our best hope. I just wanted to add one other thing. In the 15 years that I've spent talking to this young man here. <laughs> I have learned that there are important, palpable phenomena that science doesn't yet understand. The fact that we don't understand it doesn't mean it's not real. Now, we differ because he believes that some of these things we don't understand will always be a mystery. I believe 10, 20 years from now, some of those mysteries will be revealed. That's my faith. Everyone has their own faith. Mine is that science can help us more. But we shouldn't ignore the importance of what it is that we live in our lives and can't yet account for. Make use of it. Rely on it. Have hope for it. Thank you. I think that, um, Jody, you really embodied this idea of compassion for others. You've kept going with this. And there are people all over the world who are vulnerable in places where there are landmines. Uh, and you have been actively trying to get rid of them and to ban them, to protect people you will never meet. And while you've gone to many places, not every single place probably you will go where you will have this impact. So I wonder, was it, was your purpose, did, did discovering this purpose come from some, and I, forgive me if I should know this, some personal experience? Or where did this compassion, which is the end zone really, if as we understand the path of wisdom leads us, wisdom leads us to compassion. Where, how did you get there? Read my book. Okay. <laughs> All right. But give us a teaser. That was the teaser. <laughs> um, first of all, Your Holiness, I love you very deeply. But I want to let everyone know that it does not cloud my mind because often you and I fight we do we do we fight about George Bush he thinks he's great I think he's a war criminal <laughs> um, you know when I think of compassion I think of his holiness 
when I think of myself, I think of a kick-ass Vermont grassroots activist who won't take no for an answer. But why landmines? You could be choosing other things. This is something that's very tough. Landmines has been one of many things that I have done. My first political action was believing I had the right, and this is what Dolores said. Each of us have the power to decide whether we will become active in change or we will sit back and do nothing and be complicit. And people do not like to hear that. They don't like to hear that if I don't do something, I'm complicit. Silence is complicity because you give up your power and other people will take it and they will use it. My first action then was as a, how old was I, 19 year old kid, I'm younger than you, I'm only 64. But I have gained wisdom from decades of action against militarism in varying forms. Landmines was but one. Uh, I fought against the United States military intervention in Nicaragua and El Salvador during the 1980s. Um, Shireen, myself, and six, six other women, we are now six, came together to use our Nobel Prize. This is a choice. We chose to use this, uh, you know, amorphous thing to share the influence and access that we have because of it with grassroots active women around the world working for sustainable peace with justice and equality. It doesn't matter if it's landmines. It doesn't matter if it's stopping nuclear weapons, which His Holiness and I chatted about yesterday. I'm so glad he's become an active anti-nuke dude. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's stopping climate change. All of these things that people make choices to do contribute to a better world for everybody. And I, I'm sorry, I'm not as loving as you. Even the people we do not like. I have not been a Buddhist monk my entire 64 years and I don't spend six or seven hours in meditation and prayer. I'm sorry, Your Holiness, I need your guidance. There are a hell of a lot of people I do not like. <laughs> However, in all of the work I do and I believe we do and the activists that I know, we are choosing to work for a better world for everyone, even those we don't like. Otherwise, you would just be a member of a political party working for your own. And that is not working for the greater good. And I want to echo the words of Dolores, who, you know, I've met you a few times, but today I want to fall on the floor and wash your feet with my hair like Mary Magdalene or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because I totally, totally agree with every single word you said. We, and I mentioned to me, we have power. Sometimes I think those with the financial power try to disempower us and make us watch stupid television and believe that virtual reality is reality. The only time they want us to participate as citizens in the world is once every four years when they say things that get you to vote for them and then they don't do them because they really don't care. <laughs> True. We have to, as Dolores said, make choices to become active people in our own destiny. And when I say our own destiny, I mean the destiny of the world. I especially want to say to the young people, you can be part of change. It is not magic. It isn't something that only people with Nobel Prizes can do, or even His Holiness, who we can never be because he's the Buddha of compassion. And he's living, so we can't be reincarnated as him. So we're, we're left out. <laughs> we're left out of the chain. But <laughs> we have the power to make decisions about what we want to be in the world. I don't care what you want to do. 
if it's you know making your school be, use only renewable energy, if it's feeding the homeless, who in many parts of the United States today, it is illegal to feed the homeless. Like, get, wrap your brain around that one. It doesn't matter what act of good you do. Imagine if everybody had the courage to get up off their butt and volunteer a couple of hours a month, if you can't manage a couple hours a week because it might cut into the Manny Petty time, <laughs> or the beer and football time. Think about it. I mean, we all can have fun. I love great wine. A lot of it sometimes, I have to be honest. <laughs> Sorry, Your Holiness. But we all have time if we choose to use it to volunteer to make the world a better place. I started as a volunteer to stop the war in El Salvador. And look, I got the Peace Prize and got my parents off my butt to be a lawyer. <laughs> so I end with, I do love you, Your Holiness. Happy birthday to you again. And please, people, Choose to take action and show your compassion by action because praying alone will not change this very F up world. This is a quote from him that I'd like to read these last lines. Take a look at it. It's amazing. I feel um, a need, I'm not sure I should, but I feel as though I need to offer His Holiness equal time. <laughs> it's all right? <laughs> I think he's fine. Okay, so the idea of taking action and the, the drive to not be complicit by not doing anything has been embraced by you, Julia Ormond. You have worked in this passionate way to help people who are enslaved and all over the world. And I am wondering why you made this choice. But more importantly, I think, as you've talked about, uh, what it has taught you. There is something about what it has brought you. There is this idea that when we do work, when we do compassion or try to be good to others, there is something that comes back. There is a wisdom that comes back. And you have gained some. Um, thank you. You're amazing. Oh. I, I, no, can we? Yeah. I, sorry, you're amazing. Uh. Um, my, I, I'm here really as a student. I'm, and I want to share with you my experience right now in the present. Is this is completely surreal, and. I've been saying to my friends, I keep looking over my shoulder. You were very frightening when I saw you because I said, I keep looking over my shoulder for the men in white coats to come and say, come on, sweetie, we're going to take you to the mental institution because you've been telling people that you're going to be chatting with the Dalai Lama on his 80th birthday and he wants to hear what you think about compassion. And I really, I'm really in this moment hearing you talk about reality. Is it real? And it's... I, at this moment, have no idea. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna, as quickly as I can, as a student, I'm gonna try and put in place what I'm hearing from the Dalai Lama uh, into action. I, 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 I didn't go to college, I went to drama school. I don't have a single degree. Um, I don't have, and no, I don't have those things. What I have is people tell me their story. 
I love hearing people's stories. I traveled the world as an actress to different cultures, and I always love more than anything take, being taken, working with people in different cultures and being taken into their home. So it was just a natural progression to me to travel the world wanting to use story as a force for good. Um, and I ended up, I, for whatever reason, I have ended up working to mitigate, reduce, eradicate enslavement. I like to talk about enslavement instead of putting the emphasis on the, someone and leaving them with stigma. Enslavement and trafficking. Um, I, when I when I even talk about it, it brings up in me fear. So as I talk about it, I think it makes all of us afraid because it's th we see it now more and more and more and it's, it's how do we deal with this? It's fearful. When I talk about enslavement, I define it as when one person completely controls another uses violence or violent threat to maintain that control, exploits them economically and pays them effectively nothing. That is the negative. I'm gonna, the Dalai Lama has talked a lot about the importance of smiling. When we rescue children, we take them to a shelter and sometimes it takes them a month to learn to smile. The smile is about our natural resting place and our natural essence. So let's talk about the positive. How do we get to the positive? People ask questions. Where is it worst? I say, in my home. It's worst, it starts with me. But where are these millions of people? For every 1,000 people on the planet, three of us are enslaved. Think about the place where you work, how many people are in your building of work, for 1,000 people, three of us. And it's what I have learned when I see and talk to people is that the positive is really simple. The solution is really simple. We find these people in the workplace. We have to map the workforce. We need to know where these people are. It's not some mysterious hidden thing. They're working in factories, they're working in farms. How do we solve it? Or no, when does it end? Now, it ends when we choose to end it. I spoke with Dan, Verita, Dan Wiedemann very recently, who's, who's doing great work through Verite, and they help companies go all the way down their supply chain. Um, and, and they work with local people to make sure that there is a design and a proactive approach to make sure this doesn't happen. And he said, he, he said it comes down to when we decide to do it. Patagonia has just come out with an extraordinary article in the Atlantic about forced labor is in all of the garment industry. So now I want to, he, he has also said, we can't fix it alone. I need the whole industry silo of the garment industry to come together. He can't do it on his own. The only way that we can turn what's going on in our heads and the fear and what happens in our hearts when we open it up to take my hand and partner with, come on, you've got your fan. You can take my hand as well. <laughs> take my hand and partner with me. Let's do it together. We have to integrate it and then we have to share our, our wisdom across all industry all industry silos. I want people to look at a documentary. I've traveled and I've talked with many victims. There's an interesting thing that you're not really meant to ethically use the name of a victim to talk about them. I want to talk about a girl that I saw in a fabulous, fabulous because it's so heartbreaking and illuminating documentary called The True Cost. I don't know if anyone here has seen it. It's a documentary. There's a girl in it who's 23. Put your hand up if you're 23 or younger. She's a girl who's a forced laborer. She was beaten in the garment industry. She's also a mother. His Holiness has talked about the connection of maternal love. She's a mother who is beaten in her workplace. The workplace has chemicals that they're using. 
So she can't have her child there. So she's had to give her child up. She's separated from her child. So her child is suffering too. Now I want to use confession. I have my clothing and I don't know your name. I don't need to know your name. I am sorry that I did not ask who made this. I want to know who made this. And we talk about vision. I'm an English woman who celebrated fireworks with a lot of Americans just recently, Independence Day, right? Where is the vision? Martin Luther King said, now is the time. His Holiness is saying, now is the time. His Holiness talks about truths and vision. We hold these truths to be truths to be self-evident that all men I'm going to say women too. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator, by certain inalienable rights. Among these, a life, not survival, but thriving in a life, liberty, freedom, all of our freedom, and the pursuit of happiness. As an English person, I'm sorry for what we did to you as a nation, to Native Americans, to you. Thank you for articulating this. We heard children saying about we come from water. Being equal is not an aspiration. Being equal is what we are. You were, uh, and so it's taught you this word, we. Oh, all right. Do you, I, my, my thing is, is uh, I, I've been working recently with brilliant people. Nancy Giordano has, has talked about, there's this big shift going on, ethical. We have a legal structure today where companies are legally bound to go for more and more and more and more profit. And, the, and what happens on the other end of the supply chain is completely unethical, but we can see it's not what, it's not what we are and it's not who we are. The, the, the CEO of Patagonia has talked about, we want to change this because it's not what we're about, it's not who we are. So what is healing for her? Let's get to the act of compassion, let's get to an act of kindness. Who will stand with me, I, I, I'm not to dictate, who will stand with me and send a message to her, to this mother who's 23, who's in forced labor in Bangladesh, we don't know her name, but all of us feel her suffering. Can we stand together and hold hands for her? I invite you to stand with me. I invite all of the youth in the room through social media Find this woman, track her down, find the director. I mean, everyone join me. I'm learning on the spot from Dolores. We are with you. We are with you. Oh, we can do better than that. Come on. <laughs> Ready? We are with you. We are with you. This is not what we are about. This is not what we are about. And we are going to change this, and we are going to deliver human rights through the mechanism of the supply chain, instead of use <laughs> it as something to take them away. Just say yes. Yes. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, we're, 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 our blood is moving now. Um, Anthony, um, uh, I want to give you an also a chance to speak uh, because of your United for Good organization. And uh, I, your, the other idea, and I think that this is interesting because I know that, that there's a real effort to teach people through kindness, especially how do we tell, teach young people. His Holiness has taught, talked, to us to a, uh, talked to us about a lot about trying to teach kindness. Um, you are trying to, with your organization, um, start a movement of kindness as many have before. When young people commit acts of kindness, oftentimes something inside them changes that makes them want to do it again. And it becomes almost, I want to use the word addictive because that's not good, but it becomes actually a muscle. 
becomes like something you want to do. Is that what you're finding through your organization? We want to say it becomes a habit. Well, let me tell you uh, just a little bit about my story. Uh, I came from a former Soviet Union country of Belarus. It's not one country anymore. And I learned to be immigrant, to start my life from ground zero, to become a businessman, fairly large uh, corporation, to give up everything because I was not happy. I had everything that money can buy, but I was not happy. And I learned my happiness when I learned about this uh, wisdom of uh, your holiness. And it changed my life. You changed my life because I give up everything. I spent one year in seclusion in Ireland, living like hermit, almost like hermit in the in jungles of Panama to try to embarrass myself, to find out where is Dao or where is Nirvana. <laughs> then that work out. I understood it's not, you cannot make yourself a better person by just doing something for yourself. You have to learn how to affect people's life. I came back and dedicated my life to helping people. And the question is how to make it practical, how to create this a uh, habit of kindness. Do we realize that uh, in technology, it's the biggest gap right now between technolo technological progress and level of consciousness. How and uh, technology can be our best best friend and it can be our worst enemy. So how to make technology to become our best friend? How to make technology to make a difference in people's life? We don't have to necessarily watch all those movies or uh, show shows and read newspapers, internet about uh, scandals, about killings, about about uh, all bad things that happens in the world because it depressed us. We can become encouraged. We can become inspired the same way as I was inspired by learning a uh, wisdom of your holiness and then education. To me, education is the key because uh, we can educate, we have pretty much everybody, everybody is educated now, but if we can instill, if we can instill uh, values, human values into education, if we can instill kindness and compassion and empathy and love from the very beginning, from learning math and geometry and everything else, we can start seeing a result of much more positive society. So we wanted to build a movement, true movement of positivity and kindness. And uh, my good friend, uh, Lama Tenzin, he <laughs> said, compassion in action. We want to make compassion to become actionable. Today, everybody was talking about taking action, taking stand, not just reading about it, but doing something. So we want to make kindness to become truly inspiring, but become a practical, practical part of our life. We want acts of kindness to be easy, to be simple, to be, to be fashionable. We want to make a global brand of kindness, <laughs> truly. And it, it is possible, it is possible. We just have to dedicate our life to do something for somebody else. And then, only then we learn what is to be a happy person. Thank you. You're right, thank you so much, Anthony. So I think it might be important to, um, uh, be, as a matter of an act of kindness, allow our birthday boy to um, see this come to an end so that he can rest because he's had a very full day. Uh, but before uh, we do, um, I know that uh, you have a quote you've been carrying, it looks like in your wallet. Um, it looks like it's bent, uh, it's a piece of paper you've had for a while. A quote from you, Your Holiness, that you have said that has meant a great deal to Paul. And I'm going to ask him to read it because it is a very powerful quote that might be of use to you. I carry this in my wallet in the hopes that I'll have a chance to read it to young people. But it's really a message for everyone and it's your words. I'm just, this isn't me, this is you. I'm reading your words. 
we have the capacity to think several centuries into the future. Start the task, even if it will not be fulfilled within your lifetime. This generation has a responsibility to reshape the world. If we make an effort, it may be possible to achieve. Even if it seems hopeless, never give up. Offer a positive vision. With enthusiasm and joy and an optimistic outlook, we must ask ourselves, in the service of what exactly are we using whatever talents we have? If our focus serves only our personal ends, then in the long run, all of us as a species are doomed. Is it just for me or for others? For the benefit of the few or the many? For now or for the future? Your Holiness, I think it's time for us to all say goodbye to this very wonderful group. Would you have any final words you would like to say before we leave the stage? No, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I really very much impressed. Now you see these topics, uh, not for money or some other sort of purpose, but something as a uh, inner value uh, and try to make a better world. So as the people really showing, I think, genuine interest. Perhaps in uh, 20, 30 years ago, for such meeting, some people, by the first day, less number come, maybe. And even if people come, uh, some uh, dark area may feel steep. But nowadays, you see, I think more and more people really showing uh, sort of serious interest. So this is the sign of development or civilization, or progress. So this also, I think as other sort of people say, because we are facing some sort of uh, sort of problems, so then once we face real sort of difficulties, then two possibilities. One possibility is uh, sort of give up, come totally sort of demoralize like that. Another is a shaking our mind, our interactions. Then thinking, and not contented as it is, so as existing, uh, existing thing, think more. Uh, so now, seems I think that we are reached such stage. A material development, highly developed, but a lot of problems. These material sort of, I'll say the, uh, our innovations now also now using for destruction, killing. So it compels us now think, oh, I'll say that, because of something, new ideas, new way. So now, yesterday also I mentioned, now we, not just, you see, uh, so that, uh, having some kind of, oh, I enjoy that day. Not only that, make some kind of commitment uh, according to your sort of, what's the day? What's the day? your sort of, what's the feeling. Now, translate into action. So use various different professions, teachers or nurses or doctors or scientists like this person. <laughs> now their knowledge, you see, utilize how to serve humanity. 
how to utilize their sort of findings uh, to develop deeper awareness about certain reality. Up to now, not much pay attention, particularly the scientists. You see, these scientists, uh, they not much sort of pay attention about mind, only brain, brain, brain. <laughs> 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 now, now they begin to sort of showing interest the, about emotions, about mind, these things, really wonderful. This is, uh, I'm a simple Buddhist monk, but at the same time, uh, in our training or study, we use maximum way, analyze, analyzation, or analysis. So there, reason, become very important in order to carry investigation, analyze, you need some kind of skepticism, not just faith. So why, why, why? That is very important. More skepticism sort of attitude then brings questions. Question brings try to or try, uh, bring effort to investigate. Through that way, you will find the reality, or you you get the answer. So here, I think I may sort of uh, repeat one Buddha's quotation. This is not at all. I want to show Buddha Dharma is something special. I never want to do that. I never propagate Buddhism. <clears throat> but you know. Uh, why my mind uh, eventually become like, I mean, uh, eventually I become very close with scientists because, as Buddha stated, I think you heard many times, the Buddha stated, all my followers, monks, scholars, should not accept my teaching out of faith, uh, out of devotion but rather thorough investigation and experiment. Through that way, once you convince, then you accept my teaching. So this quite sort of scientific way. So therefore, uh, my body, this, this person, half Buddhist monk, half scientist. <laughs> Many years ago, you see, actually, our, our organization's founder, as a late Varela, Francisco Varela, Francisco Varela, he used to say, uh, say the subject is sometimes is related with certain sort of spiritual thing. Then he mentioned, now he wear Buddhist cap. <laughs> then when you see, talk about. So, scientific perspective, then he meant, he say, now I had this sort of the scientist cap like that. So me also, I think like that. I, 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 I found it that way. I really believe scientists. Some scientists, their way of thinking is a little bit narrow-minded. <laughs> but now these scientists really, I think, open mind. They really they say, try to know more, further, further, further. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So the gauntlet has been thrown for you to find uh, greater wisdom through your experiences, to be open to the things that are good and bad that happen to you in your life so that you can find wisdom that will lead you to compassion. I can tell you His Holiness has told me that uh, he has heard from his doctors that he can, his physical condition is in such great shape he could possibly live another 30 years. So he's going to check up on you. So 
So do your task and he will come in and see how you're doing on your wisdom and your compassion. Bob Thurman. 60 seconds. I want to, in the spirit of these wonderful activists who want to, especially Jody, disagree with everybody, and Shireen standing up and jumping, I want to ask the audience to join me in offering one present to you, Your Holiness, on your birthday, and also listening to you talking about the slavery and the enslavement. People, we're in this wonderful group of 18 or many thousand people. If each one of us would pledge as a birthday present for His Holiness to do something for the Tibetan people. The Tibetan people, the Tibetan people are under a colonial situation, which is a kind of slavery, and they are very unhappy. And this man who comes to us and gives us such hope and encouragement, carries their feeling in his heart all the time, and yet remains joyful and happy for us. And we sort of, and he never asks special pleads for his people, which is always in his heart, like a wound, like a wound in his heart. So I just say, if everyone here, would you ask to you know, say something? Say yes. Each one, let's do something, even just informing yourself. Let, with your wisdom, let's do something for, will you do something for Tibet, for His Holiness? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Your Holiness. Many, many years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Where was it made? <laughs> made in China. I think now, now it is made in India. Oh, sorry, you hold it. I hope I didn't embarrass you. Sorry. I hope I didn't embarrass you. Sorry. I hope I didn't embarrass you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No? Now. Oh. Bye. No. Thank you, thank you, thank you. No. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. No, 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 no time. No time. Thank you, thank you.